This case takes us to Essex, England, where a woman named Jennifer Cronin had a daughter named Susan. The two were extremely close. Susan really looked up to her mother ever since she was a child and wanted her to be proud and approve of her choices. This included finding a husband. So around the late 80s, early 90s, when Susan was working as a hairdresser, she met a construction worker named Kieran Lynch, who was three years older than herself. And Susan really loved Kieran. He seemed like a caring man that was also hard working. Susan thought that she and Kieran could do an amazing job raising a family, but Susan had to make sure that her parents, specifically her mother Jennifer, also liked Kieran. And she did. Ultimately, Kieran and Susan got married in the mid 90s and had two daughters named Matilda and Molly. For a while, the Lynches seemed like an ideal family with two loving parents and children who loved them back. Even Jennifer was frequently visiting her granddaughters, who couldn't wait to see her each time. But little did anyone know that what was seen on the outside did not reflect the internal workings of the relationship between Kieran and Susan. You see, Kieran was someone who not only wanted but felt that he needed to excel at everything he did. This led him down a path of working long and physically taxing work hours every single week. In Kieran's mind, he felt that this was the bare minimum in order to provide his family with a proper life. And as you could imagine, Kieran was often mentally and physically exhausted, leading to outbursts of rage at home. At first, this manifested through yelling and smashing objects. When the stress was too much for Kieran to handle, he would resort to alcohol, which didn't do anything for the man except make his situation worse. At times, he would even lash out against his family, the very people that he was working so hard to support. So on the mornings after one of his violent fits, he would apologize to his wife and kids and say that he will do better. But time after time, Kieran just slipped back into these bouts of anger. Susan started asking herself how Kieran went from such a kind man to someone so unstable. She hoped that with time, Kieran would eventually return to his past self, so she didn't tell anyone about his violent outbursts in fear that someone might report him to authorities. The daughters also seemed to understand their mother's sentiments and tried their best to comfort her. When friends and family of Susan's would ask about how her husband was doing, she would tell lies in order to hide the stressful situation that she was in. But these lies only worked to temporarily. One day, one of Susan's friends was out and about and saw a man that looked strikingly similar to Kieran. So she tapped a guy on the back and asked, is that you Kieran? And when the man turned around, she kind of jumped a bit. The man had an extremely lean and haggard appearance, but she could tell that this was indeed Kieran. As a result of his poor mental health and stress, Kieran had lost an immense amount of weight. But along with the stress, there was another factor to blame for his drastic change in appearance. Sometime in 2014 to 2015, Susan was doing the laundry and was in the process of emptying the pockets of Kieran's work uniform. And inside one of these pockets, she found a tube of an illegal white substance amongst other items. Again, Susan was well aware of the hardships Kieran was going through and the stress he was dealing with, but she had no idea that Kieran was using such substances. Susan didn't know what to do next, but eventually confronted Kieran about her discovery. Kieran was furious at first, but begged her not to tell their kids about this. Susan agreed that keeping the kids out of this discussion would probably be the best option, but she wanted Kieran to seek professional help so that they could put an end to all of this drama. Kieran just remained silent with no response. Over the following weeks, Susan started noticing large transactions on her credit card statements and knew that Kieran was the one behind them. She confronted her husband about these purchases, but she was met with animosity, and it was at this point where the relationship really turned for the worst. There was of course violence in the past, but now Kieran was threatening Susan's life as well as his own. Susan was getting to the point where she felt as though she was backed into a corner with no options. She really wanted to tell her mother Jennifer about this and get her advice, but deep down she felt that if she involved her mother, she might be in danger as well. So Susan knew that if drastic measures weren't taken, something bad was eventually going to happen. So she ended up parting ways with Kieran after over two decades of marriage. Susan deeply cared for Kieran despite all the hardships the two had been through, and Kieran was reluctant to say goodbye, but later agreed that this was probably the best choice for both of them and their children. 
For a few years, Susan and her children really enjoyed their new lives. There was never the stress of wondering whether Kieran might come home one night angry, and the former couple occasionally talked to each other, but over time, this became more and more rare. Eventually, Susan had completely moved on from Kieran and met a new man named Mike. And I should mention, Susan and Kieran hadn't gone through an official divorce yet. The two had simply agreed that they would go off and live separate lives. So Susan called Kieran one day to organize a meetup and discuss her intentions to officially divorce. She informed Kieran that she had met a new man and was really happy with him, and their daughters Matilda and Molly also seemed to like him as well. And Kieran seemed to be genuinely happy for Susan and their daughters. He agreed to sign the divorce, and the two spent the day catching up with each other. Susan told Kieran that he was going to find another woman soon to spend his life with. Right as Susan's life seemed to be going perfectly, it did a complete 180. On January 11th, 2018, Susan was bombarded with angry and violent text messages sent by Kieran. In stark contrast to their meeting, Kieran was now threatening Susan's life. He demanded $60,000 in cash in return for his signature on the divorce papers. Kieran added, saying that he left everything else to Susan, so the least she could do is give him this money. But before Susan could de-escalate the situation, Kieran had showed up to her home. He was on the patio with a hammer, smashing everything in sight. Susan immediately ran to find a place to hide and then called police. But when they arrived, Kieran was nowhere to be seen. Susan explained the situation to authorities, stating that Kieran had a bad history with alcohol and other substances, and that they may be the cause for this attack. Right as police were about to leave, Kieran showed up again and tried to get inside of the home, but obviously police stopped that from happening. At first, police were actually about to let Kieran go, but after he started flailing around and shoving the officers, he was arrested. As they handcuffed him and sat him down in their cruiser, he started shouting obscenities towards Susan, who was watching the whole event unfold from her patio. Kieran was facing three charges consisting of possessing a dangerous weapon, causing property damage, and displaying life-threatening behavior. A little over two weeks later on the 29th, Kieran was granted bail and told to not go anywhere near Susan, her daughters, or the home. But Kieran didn't listen to this at all. He constantly called Susan's phone, as well as their daughter's phones. Susan stated that between the three, they would receive anywhere from 80 to 100 calls or texts a day. Kieran even showed up to the home a few times as well. Even after informing authorities that Kieran was violating his bail conditions, Conditions, he was never arrested. Kieran even called emergency services, saying that he was going to end it all, but he was too scared. Authorities rushed to his location to defuse the situation, and they were successful. They suggested that Kieran talk to a professional therapist as soon as possible, and he agreed. Then, the very next day, he was back to his antics of messing with his former family. He did things like sneak into the garage of Susan's residence and turn off the power, and then throw various items around in the front yard. Kieran even started visiting his former mother-in-law Jennifer's home and knocking on her windows before fleeing. Once once again, Susan called authorities stating that not only was her life in danger, but her daughter's and her mother's as well. But police more or less disregarded her concerns, saying that Kieran was no real threat and that this was normal for couples going through divorce. Then unexpectedly, Kieran started hurling charged messages towards his own daughters. After Susan told police about this, they told her to leave home and spend a few days somewhere else. So Susan took Matilda and stayed the night at a friend's house while Molly was sent off to stay with her grandma, Jennifer. On the first night that Molly was sent to Jennifer's, she received several phone calls, all of which were silent. Nobody responded at all when Jennifer asked if anyone was on the other end. Then around 2 a.m., Molly noticed what looked to be a man in the backyard. Jennifer and Molly hid inside the house and called police while also spam texting Susan's phone telling her that Kieran might be there. The police said that they were understaffed so there would be a delay in sending someone over. But luckily, nothing had happened that night. An officer did a brief search of the property but found no signs of Kieran. Then, fast forward to March 13th, 2018, this entire case comes to its peak. Susan stopped by her mother's home to pick up Molly. She comforted and reassured 
assured her mother that they would be fine in the end. Jennifer lived alone after her husband died several years ago. Jennifer wasn't so much worried for herself, but more so for Susan and her kids. While Jennifer was out in her garden with her dog, Susan and Molly were inside the home preparing some drinks. Then out of nowhere, Kieran comes out charging towards Jennifer. It was around 10.50 to 11 a.m. when this occurred. As Kieran came face to face with his former mother-in-law, he started dousing her in petrol while calling her all of these terrible names. Susan witnessed all of this happening from a window and called police who advised her to create as much distance from Kieran as possible. Susan sprinted out of the home with her daughter, but realizing that she couldn't leave her mother behind, Susan went back to try and help her. But right as she came into view of Kieran and her mother, Kieran poured what remained of the fluid on himself and sparked a lighter. Instantly, he and Jennifer caught fire. The fire was reported and alongside police arrived firefighters. When the fire had subsided, both Kieran and Jennifer were on the brink of death. Susan used these exact words to describe Kieran. He looked like pink charred meat. She also shared in a later interview that she believed Kieran targeted her mother because she knew that it would hurt her more than killing anyone else. He knew how close I was to my mom and he knew how much we meant to each other and I think it was the biggest way of hurting me. So Kieran and Jennifer were transported to the hospital. Ultimately, they both succumbed to their wounds and died. Matilda and Molly still had that image of their father being a kind, hardworking man, so it was tough for them to accept the horrible crime he had just committed. When they visited him in the hospital, his entire face was unrecognizable. 72-year-old Jennifer had similar injuries to Kieran all along her body. And at first, doctors thought that there was a slight chance that they could save her, but as I just shared, they did end up failing. She was able to fight on for about two weeks before ultimately dying on the 30th. Her injuries were just way too severe. Susan stated that her mother had lost all of her hair due to the attack, but despite how gruesome her end was, Susan said that she looked so serene in her last moments. In January of 2019, it was determined that Jennifer was was unlawfully killed and Kieran had died by Law enforcement has faced immense scrutiny from the public with this case. Despite knowing about Kieran's unstable mental health and tumultuous relationship with various substances, they never took the necessary steps to ensure that he was of no harm. So this next case is also foreign, but this one takes place in Sweden, and it has very scarce details available in English, so I had to translate some Swedish articles and sources to research. I tried to look over a bunch of different translated readings to make sure the details were correct, but there might be a few things that got lost in translation. Lisa Holm is the name of a 17-year-old girl in Sweden who mysteriously disappeared in June of 2015. As more and more details were unraveled about her case, it was soon realized that Lisa was a tragic victim of a terrible and violent act. Lisa was born on February 7th, 1998 and grew up in Skavda. Lisa was like any other teenager who enjoyed spending time with friends and family. She was kind and her mother described her as an immensely caring and compassionate young woman. Around the time when she graduated from high school, she found a job at a cafe located in Blom which was about 30 to 40 minutes from her home. Lisa had plans to go to university the following school year and pursue a degree in social sciences. At this age, young adults tend to look for more time and opportunities to act as individuals. Lisa was no different. Her father had purchased his moped for her to use to get to and from work. And like any parent, this particular stage is very worrisome for them, so Lisa's dad accompanied her to work for the first few weeks just to make sure that there weren't any issues. So by June 7th, both of Lisa's parents were comfortable with her making the journey to work alone. Lisa reached a cafe without issue and her shift proceeded as expected. Lisa, along with a couple of her co-workers, were responsible for closing up the shop. So after they were done wiping down all the equipment and cleaning up the floors, Lisa sent a text to her dad at about 6.20 p.m. This was the first time that Lisa went out on her own, so she just wanted to let her parents know that everything was fine and she was on her way back now. Her mom and dad were relieved to hear that there were no issues and told Lisa that they looked forward to hearing about her day. Again, the drive from Skavda, Lisa's home, and Blomberg, the location of the cafe, should have taken Lisa no longer than 40 or so minutes to finish. 
finish. So once the clock struck 7.30, Lisa's dad started to worry. He called Lisa's phone over and over and over, but no one picked up. He didn't even want to think about the possibility that something bad had happened. So he just got on the path to Blomberg, hoping that he would cross paths with Lisa at some point down the road. However, at no point in the actual drive did he see Lisa. So he went ahead and completed the journey all the way to the cafe in Blomberg. And there it was, Lisa's moped. Instantly, the father felt this sense of release course through his body. So he goes inside of the cafe and looks for Lisa. But he just can't seem to find her. He tells the manager that he's looking for his daughter, Lisa Holm, but they tell him that she left. Now it became clear that something was definitely wrong. The manager realizes that Lisa is missing, so while her father searches the area, the manager contacts police. Outside, Lisa's dad realized that the keys were still in the moped. He couldn't think of any good scenario where Lisa would intentionally leave her keys behind, so his mind shifted to the possibility of Lisa being abducted. Both police and Lisa's family searched for her for several days but couldn't find her. What they did find were her phone case, a receipt, a ticket, and a phone screen that had been destroyed. There was also a glove that was located in this bar barn that was nearby the cafe. But the strange thing about this glove was that the barn it was found in was actually searched the first day that Lisa went missing, but it wasn't found until a day or two later. All of these items were confirmed to belong to Lisa. Then, on Wednesday the 10th, more items of Lisa's were found. These included some earrings and her license. The earrings were found in that same barn where her glove was found, and it was on this day that authorities finally released Lisa's name to the public. You see, the days prior, investigators actually kept Lisa's name a secret and only revealed that there was a teenage girl that had gone missing on the 7th of June. After Lisa's identity was made public, a massive search party of over 1,000 people came forward to help search, and one of these volunteers decided to give that barn another search and he found human excrement. Authorities, for whatever reason, believe that this was from whoever abducted Lisa. With this new and improved larger search party, a lot more ground could be covered. One group of volunteers decided to take a look at a nearby farm, but right as they were pulling up to it, two people came out to them and said, hey, we already searched the spot and there's nothing. So the group trusted them and left. But later on, a couple of people from that group said that the two people that confronted them were really suspicious. So they told police about them and they searched the area anyway. Hidden among some branches, they found Lisa's jacket and helmet. And nearby was this sort of rundown shed slash trailer that looked almost abandoned. Authorities set their sights there to search next. And immediately after opening the door, this foul odor just burst through that opening. There was one part of the trailer that seemed to grab everyone's attention. In one corner were these lockers, and they were all closed except for one. The one locker left open seemed to be filled with clothing and other items. Investigators got closer and started pulling back some of the clothes, and then they saw her, Lisa. Lisa's lifeless body had been hidden away behind all of the various items in that locker. Part of her clothing had been removed, and there was also a rope around her neck. Additionally, someone had placed tape across her mouth. Investigators were able to find foreign DNA on Lisa, as well as on the items they recovered that day. Now, this particular area, specifically the land where the barn and this shed slash trailer were, is called the Martorp Estate. And there is also a home on the property, which housed two brothers and one of their wives. The brothers were Lithuanian citizens, and to my understanding, they were simply working on the farm. Authorities ended up arresting the trio, and after some investigation into them, one of the brothers matched the DNA found on Lisa. This brother's name was Narajus Belevichus. He was born on March 3rd, 1980, putting him in his mid-30s at the time of the crime. So I'd like to go back and discuss the barn. Again, some information may have been skewed with translation, and I believe this is the case with the barn. But if you recall, I stated that there were various items found within the barn, but it took several visits on different days to thoroughly investigate this barn. And from the pictures and video I saw of it, I just 
just didn't understand why that was the case. It didn't seem like it was massive from the outside and from the pictures that I saw of the inside, it wasn't exactly like there were hidden rooms or anything. But anyways, what I wanted to talk about was that after authorities had arrested Narajuice, they went back to the barn and stated that there was a room inside that overlooked the cafe where Lisa worked. And again, this wasn't some hidden room, it was just there in plain sight. In this room, there was this window that could watch people coming in and out of the cafe. On both that window and the wall right underneath it, investigators found Narajuice's bodily fluids all dried up some of which had been discolored and had been there for a very long time. And it was either a news outlet or people in the public that later dubbed this the milking room. Lisa's co-workers told police that they actually saw Narajus and his brother looking at them through that window almost every day. But of course, they had no idea what they were doing, so they thought nothing of it. In that room, there was also a piece of rope tied to this pipe coming out of the wall that also had traces of Lisa's DNA. When medical officials officials inspected Lisa's body, they didn't find any signs of rape. If you recall, there was Narajuice's DNA found on Lisa, but that's it, only on her. So investigators tried to piece together what exactly happened, because Narajuice was really hard to deal with. Despite the staggering amount of evidence against him, he denied being the culprit. The following scenario is what police believed happened. When Lisa was leaving for work, Narajuice attacked Lisa before she could ride off. He moved her to the barn and then to that disgusting room where he had Lisa suspended by that pipe. Investigators do believe that Narajuice had the intention of Lisa, but he got too quote-unquote excited, hence the DNA on her body. And it was in that moment that Lisa lost her life after running out of oxygen. From there, Narajus had no interest in the girl anymore, so he moved her to that locker in that little rundown shed. Initially, Narajus, his brother, and his wife all gave alibis, but eventually, his brother did give in and reveal the details of the crime. According to him, Narajus had come home on the night when Lisa disappeared and went straight to the washing machine. He tossed his pants, shirt, socks, everything inside. Narajus then told his brother that a girl had just gone missing and that since they were both Lithuanian and really close to where she worked, they would be suspected of being the ones responsible. So the two needed to come up with alibis that would fool the police. Narajus didn't actually tell his brother that he killed Lisa. Narajus went on trial in November of 2015 and was ultimately sentenced to life in prison. During his trial, it was revealed that Narajus had a lot of dark and sadistic on his computer, which may have played a role in leading to his decision to attack Lisa. Prosecutors stated that Narajus suspending Lisa in the barn may have been something he had seen in one of his videos. In a somewhat shocking turn of events, Narajus's lawyers actually tried to shift the blame to his brother, saying that he had framed Narajus for the crime. But this obviously fell apart. The rest of Narajus's family seemed to be innocent. And one more detail before we move on to some closing statements is that during the time when Lisa first went missing, there was this YouTube video posted to a channel called Lisa Holm. It was titled 13 and the video showed a countdown, but the video ended before the timer could actually run all the way out. It was believed that the owner of this channel was Lisa's abductor at the time, and once that timer ran out completely, some big reveal with Lisa's whereabouts was going to be revealed. But it turned out that this entire YouTube channel was a sick prank, and I believe the original video and channel are gone, but there is a re-upload. So in 2016, Narajus was locked up in a prison located within Sweden, but in 2017, he was transferred to Lithuania. And he actually won an appeal, apparently, when he was transferred, which changed the sentence to 15 years. But then, this was later retracted, and he was yet again given a life sentence. So, thank god. But not like this would really matter, because in 2022, Narajus was actually killed by another inmate. Officials did attempt to transport him to a hospital, but he was DOA. Apparently, Narajus faced constant harassment from other inmates while he was still imprisoned in Sweden, and this justified bullying, I guess you could call it, continued even after his transfer. It's rumored that at one point, someone dumped hot water that was borderline boiling on top of him. 